So uh, thanks for being here this morning. Uh, before we get started, real quick, I just want to thank um, my church family for uh, just surprise appreciation this morning. I thought we were just getting together for some food and hanging out with some cool people. So we got together with food and hung out with cool people. So thank you for, uh, thank you for doing that. Um, I'm blessed beyond measure, and our family is as well, uh, just to be a part of this group. And um, just because I stand up here on a Sunday doesn't mean my role is any different than anybody else's. I, I want us to just love God with all of our heart, soul, and mind together and, and see what he does. Because um, he does some pretty amazing things. And so thank you again for that and for the, the cards and words of appreciation and gifts. And, and um, some, of the, 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 some of the young guys made some handmade stuff, which is really just amazing, awesome. So um, if you're uh, with us, uh, or, or actually, whether you've been with us or not, we're kind of in the middle of a interrupted series where it's like a mini series within a series. So we were walking through the book of Ephesians and then we kind of pressed pause when we got to the section in chapter five of Ephesians that starts talking about marriage and relationships. We thought, you know what, it's probably not a bad idea to just kind of camp there for, for a few weeks um, because I mean, how many of us couldn't learn a little bit more about relationships, right? Whether it's marriage or dating or uh, family or work or, or whatever, the relationships you may have, it, it's always good to, to lean in and, and maybe learn a little bit more. Um, but just to refresh your memory uh, a little bit, catch you up. Uh, last week, you're probably looking at this like, what is this? If you weren't here last week, this probably doesn't make any sense. If you were here, you remember we talked a little bit about boxes, right? And we said that basically, whenever you walk into a relationship, you carry with you a box of hopes and dreams and desires. It's just, it's just part of what comes with you. A lot of people say it's baggage. I don't know that it's baggage. It's not avoidable. You can't avoid it. it it's just what you learn about like your, what you think your relationship is going to look like. And so we talked a little bit about that. We talked about like uh, conflict of, you know, how do we, how do we deal with conflict and, and chores? And we have these ideas of, hey, this is what I think the relationship is going to be like. This is what I think is going to be true of the relationship. And so whether you're, um, you're you know, even if you're single or, or just newly dating, you already have expectations as well as to what that relationship may look like or what will be true of that relationship. And so we talked a little bit about that last week. And, and the challenge that, that I think we, we come to understand is that whenever we bring these expectations or these ideas into a relationship, we just kind of carry them with us. Like, how is, you know, how are we going to treat each other? And how are finances going to be handled? If this goes further and it goes into marriage, like, how's the division of labor? I mean, how do we do all these things? And we have these ideas. The problem is, is when that happens, all of this centers around me. Right? This, this, this centers around me. These are my hopes. These are my dreams. These are my desires for what I believe the relationship is going to look like. Right? And so maybe a better way to explain it is, oh, whoops, I just lost my mic pack. There we go. Anyway, I'll put that right there. Um, but one, maybe a better way to explain it is when I was thinking about marriage when I, years ago, many, many, many years ago, we've been married for quite a while, but years ago when I was thinking about marriage, I never thought about or imagined or dreamed about becoming the right person for someone else. Am I the only person? Uh, I actually thought about and dreamed about and imagined who would be the right person for me right? I, I, didn't, I didn't spend a lot of time thinking about, well, how do I become the right person for someone else? I was kind of trapped in the idea of how do I find the right person for me? So when I met Carrie, I figured that's the right person for me, right? And so when we were married, I walked down the aisle and I brought her ring and my box to the wedding. Not literally, I didn't bring this, that would have been weird. <laughs> but the idea was I bring her ring and I bring my hopes, my desires, my dreams to the wedding. And she did the same. And, and, and the problem is, is when I brought all this, I figured, hey, she must understand that this is how it would work because this is how it should work. Because in my mind, that's how it's always going to be working. And I mean, she brought her own box as well. And, and the problem with that is when we, when we walk into a relationship like that, what, what seems like reasonable hopes, dreams, and desires, these kind of seem reasonable to each of us, when we hand them to the person that we're getting into that relationship with or we're walking into marriage with, instead of feeling like hopes, dreams, and desires to them, feels like this, right? Feels like expectations, that all of a sudden you start to have these conversations and sometimes they're heated conversations. And, and when you're first married, they're not heated. They're like polite arguments. And then after a few years, politeness just goes out the window. You just start throwing stuff. We'll talk about that next week, actually. Um, sometimes you just have to throw things. So that'll teaser kind of get you back. Um, yeah. Uh, but, that's, but that's what it feels like. 
instead of feeling like these reasonable hopes, dreams, and desires, felt like I just handed her a box of expectations, how I wanted us to handle conflict, which was, hey, we just don't talk about it. It's somehow it fixes itself, right? Nobody, it doesn't, so I don't know if that, you know, how we handle finances. She does a such better job of handling finances than I do, but I had this idea of how it was gonna work. And because I held on to my way of doing things, kind of messed us up until I went, oh, you know what, you're really a lot better at this than I am. And so this whole idea that she walks into the relationship with a set of expectations, I walk into it, and we talked a little bit about this, that, that here's the definition of expectations, right? It's a strong belief that something will happen or be the case in the future, right? So, so even if you walk down the aisle and believe that, hey, this won't happen tomorrow, they're not gonna see it the way I see it tomorrow, there's a chance, there's a really good chance, there's a strong belief that that will definitely be the case at some point in the future. Sorry guys, I'm all like tangled up here. <laughs> yeah, too much coffee. That's the problem. There we go. So, but it, the problem as well with this idea of expectations being handled off, handed off, it's the subtle but constant pressure that things are going to be a certain way. You ever have that? Like it's, it's almost passive aggressive. It's like you're not real happy with what is happening the way it's happening. So there's like this subtle constant pressure that it's going to change and you're going to do it differently. And, and you don't really say it. So you ask these leading questions that become very passive aggressive. Like, oh, is... Is, is that how we're going to do housework today? Is that, you know, these, you, like this weird, maybe that's just, I told you guys, some of this is ours, some of this isn't, so you guys got to figure out what part of this, like, Carrie and I wrestle with. Uh, here's the problem, though. When couples exchange boxes, they begin bargaining and negotiating and bribing one another. Right? So I've heard that said that like, hey, when we stepped into marriage, I had my box, she had her box, and we just started kind of, well, we'll handle conflict this way, but we'll handle chores that way. And, and we started kind of doing this whole idea of negotiation and, and bribing, and well, if we'll do it your way this time, next time we're going to do it this way. And it's this whole thing, and the relationship becomes very negotiated, and it becomes very contractual. And what begins to happen in that kind of a relationship is it begins to take on a debt-debtor dynamic. It begins to take on this idea that, well, we did it your way last time. You owe it to me to do it my way this time. You owe me. I handed you this. This is what I expect. You now owe me this because this is all of my hopes and my dreams and desires, and I trusted you with them, and now you owe this to me, right? And that was kind of the, the idea. You end up in kind of a debt-debtor relationship. And in that kind of relationship, Owe me eliminates love me. And I'll explain this a little bit. In a relationship characterized by debt debtor dynamic, love struggles because it becomes difficult to receive and appreciate what we believe someone else owes us. Remember, we talked a little bit about that last week. Like, how, how grateful, how thankful are you to people who do what you expected them to do? How grateful are you to people who pay you what they owe you? Not very. They owe it. That's you, that's, I expected it. That's what you're supposed to do, right? And so, owe me begins to eliminate love me. Let me, let me illustrate it this way, if I can. If you owe me money, you can't give me money. Does that make sense? So, if you owe me money and you give me money, I don't see it as a gift. I don't receive it as a gift. I see it and I receive it as payment for what you owed me. That happens in relationships. That, that, it, 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 that dynamic carries into relationships. In a relationship that's characterized by a debt-debtor dynamic, as long as someone feels like the other person owes them, they can't see or receive what is given as love. And the other person can't really extend love because every time they try to extend anything, it gets viewed as a payment. That's what you owe me. So it's hard for love to grow in that environment. It, it kills love in relationships because it's all about you. You owe me that anyway. So why should I be incredibly grateful and thankful and, 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 and reciprocate? Because it's what you owed me. So how do we keep this from happening? How do we keep legitimate hopes, dreams, and desires? Because what I'm telling you today, guys, is I don't think you should just throw out your hopes, your dreams, and desires. That's part of what makes you up, and that's part of what you bring to the relationship. So how do we maintain, how do we keep legitimate hopes, dreams, and desires from feeling like or becoming expectations for the other person? 
You know, how do we, how do we keep it, you know, here and not turn it into this and hand it off to somebody? And, and we talked a little bit about that last week. And the answer, uh, the way we answer that question is the way that happy couples answered the following question. So here's the following question. We wrestled with this a little bit last week. What does he owe me? What does she owe me? In your relationship, think about what does that other person owe you? And, and we decided that happy couples, the answer for happy couples, the answer hopefully for all of us, is nothing. They owe you nothing. And I know that sounds harsh, but we have this idea that, well, I've invested and I've and I've and I've and I've and who is this all about again? It's you. It's about you. They owe you nothing. But happy couples realize that they owe each other everything, but they are not owed anything in return, which doesn't make any sense. And we talked about that last week, that it doesn't make any sense that to walk around feeling, I, like, I feel like I owe Carrie everything, but she doesn't owe me anything. But what I'm finding out is the more I'm around happy couples, there's something about the relationship that doesn't make any sense. It's just weird. In a good way, weird. Like, how do these two even coexist? Like, there's like oil and, you know, water, and, and, but somehow they're happy and, and they make it work and something like that. The greatest relationships are not relationships built on negotiation and bargaining. Okay, so just, if, that, if that's kind of the dynamic of your relationship, I'm gonna ask you to really look closely at your relationship and, and, and prayerfully this morning begin to back away from that dynamic of negotiation and bargaining, and if you, then I will. The happiest, the, the greatest relationships are marked by this word, you guys. Submission. And so everybody just went, oh no. It's the submission talk. <laughs> All right. But, but it's the idea that she or he doesn't owe me anything, but I ho owe her or I owe him everything. It's that idea, it's, it really, it's that same idea that we've been talking about, that they don't owe me anything, but I owe them everything. And today, I want us to see where this idea comes from. And, and so here's, here's how it happened, right? At the end of Jesus' ministry, he's just hours from going to the cross, and he's, he's, me he's meeting with his closest followers, right? And, they're, and, they're, and he's giving some of these final instructions to them before he would be arrested and before he would, he would be crucified, and he's giving them kind of the, the final instructions before he would leave. And at some point that evening, after, he had, after Jesus had washed everyone's feet and after Judas had been dismissed to run his errand, Jesus said, I'm going to give you a new command, and for us the, that are Bible readers, 21st century Christians, you know, that kind of stuff, we've been maybe around church, you read the Bible a lot. We read this, and, and, and I'll show you where we read it in just a second. It's in, it's in the book of John. But we read this, and this doesn't upset us at all. Like, we just like, oh, yeah, he just gave us a new command. Let me, we miss something in this because of our culture and because of the context. We really miss something. And I want to walk us through it a little bit so we understand, like, how big of a deal this was. So he says, I'm going to give you a new command. Let me just share with you. The fact that the 11 Jewish disciples didn't get, get up and walk out of the upper room that night is a miracle. And I'm going to share with you why. Because they understood the only person that can give a command is God. And he had already given all the commands through Moses. They understood that. They understood that you don't, we don't get new commands. There's no new command. There's only the old commands that were given by God. And the only person that can give us a command is God. And he already did so through Moses. The only you, thing you could do with a command is you could talk about the command. You could exegete the commands. You could explain the commands. You could apply the commands. You could even prioritize the commands. But you could not give a new command. And so when Jesus said this, he basically said, hey, guys, I'm stepping in front of Moses I'm speaking as the only one with all of the authority to give you a new command. And here's what he said. A new command I give you, love one another. And the disciples were probably like, that's not new. And, and Jesus would be like, yeah, but I'm, I'm, not, I'm not through either. Here we go. A new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you. So you must love one another. So I don't know, like sometimes we miss out on the fact that this was such an epic 
moment. Jesus basically said, I'm going to take all 613 Jewish laws, narrow them down to two, and now I'm narrowing them all down to one simple command. This is your one all-encompassing command. This is your marching orders for, for your life relationally. This is what your life looks like. I'm taking all of the old law. I already narrowed it down to two when you asked me, hey, what's the most important laws and all the command? And I said, hey, love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, and your strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. By the way, those were still old commands. He was still piggybacking off of the Old Testament, the old covenant, the old commands. And, he, and hours before he would go to the cross, he says, I'm going to give you, before I go, I'm going to give you one command. That's it. That's it. That's the command. You are to treat others the way I have treated you. And so we, we, we hit on this a little bit in our, our life group on Wednesday night. We were talking a little bit. Just think for a minute, picture for a minute, the people that are sitting in this room having the, this conversation with Jesus. Think about who these people were and how Jesus had treated them. I mean, when you think about some of the characters in the room that evening, Matthew, Jesus like, Matthew, you, you were a tax collector when I met you. You were an embarrassment to your family. You were an embarrassment to your nation. It, it, no one wanted anything to do with you because you had betrayed your own, your own country people. You were working for Rome. Nobody wanted anything to do with you, Matthew. But Matthew, do you remember what I said to you when I met you? Matthew's like, yeah, you, you, you said, follow me. Yeah, Matthew, and, and, and then what do we do after you said that you would, after I invited you to follow me? Where do we go? Well, we went to my house. Matthew, do you, do you remember who we invited? And Peter speaks up. I remember who you invited because I can't stand all those people. And we hung out with all of Matthew's tax collecting friends. I have no idea why we would do that. And Jesus is like, yeah, Matthew, from here on out, I need you to treat every person you meet with the same kind of grace and mercy that I treated you with. And hey, hey, Nathaniel, remember when we met, you like dissed me and my whole family, my hometown. Do you guys remember that story? You remember the story about Nathaniel? Like, yeah, Nathaniel's like, what are you talking about, Jesus of Nazareth? Nothing good comes from Nazareth. And Jesus knew he had said that. Still, he invites Nathaniel to follow him. He's, Nathaniel, I, remember when you said that? Yeah. Did I ever bring it up again? Did I ever hold that over you? Did I ever make you feel guilty and feel horrible about the fact that you dissed my family and my grandfamily and my stickball team and my whole town? Like, did, you, did I ever make you feel horrible? About, no, you didn't. Yeah, so Nathaniel, you, you need to treat everyone else with the same kind of grace I treated you. And just a few hours later, Jesus would be arrested and tried and crucified and these disciples would realize that Jesus gave his life on our behalf and he was asking us to do the same for everyone else. That's what that means. You know, a lot of times we think about, you know, the golden rule, right? What's the golden rule? Remember the golden rule? Treat others as you want to be treated. That's the platinum rule. Treat others the way that God through Christ has treated you. Treat others the way that he has treated you. The single greatest command for us as Christians in every single imperative that shows up in the New Testament after the resurrection hinges off of that. Do you know that? Every single command that you will read in the New Testament after the resurrection of Jesus hinges off of this one all-encompassing central command. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. So a few years later, the Apostle Paul would take this big idea of love others the way Christ has loved us, and he begins to apply it to all kinds of relationships. Because a lot of times we think, well, I'm supposed to be that way to my neighbor. Yeah, Paul said, oh, by the way, you're supposed to do that in your marriage as well. That, that, that this applies to all of your relationships. There's not a relationship that's excluded from this command. He's, and he, and he, he narrows it down, and he even says, hey, including marriage, so, so whenever you read something the Apostle Paul has written in his letters regarding what we should or shouldn't do as Christians, every one of his commands, believe it or not, is directly linked to that command. Everything. Everything you read that the Apostle Paul says, hey, as a Christian, you should, it's linked back to this idea. Every single command, it, it all is it, it, connected back to, way, to the command to treat others the way that Jesus has treated us. So Paul, when you're reading in the New Testament and you come across something and you go, 
well, that's different. That's like something, that's a command that I'm, I, I wasn't ready for it. I don't understand. Paul never writes any new commands. All he does is apply Jesus' old command. He, he, all he does is apply what Jesus said. He's not giving us new commands. He's like, here's how that looks in marriage. This is what it looks like in your work life. This is what it looks like in family life. This is what it looks like in, in society. He, he just continues to help us apply the command that Jesus gave us. So in his letter to the church at Ephesus, Paul applies Jesus' command to marriage. And this is what he says, right? Wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as you do to the Lord. Everybody good there? Cool, let's pray. Let's go home. <laughs> Father, no, I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. Um, yeah, this is a tough one, right? We, we kind of wrestle with this. And so as soon, I knew as soon as we put this up, it's going to bother some people. So one, I'm really glad it bothers you. Two, I'm going to leave it up there a little bit longer to bother you a little bit longer. And three, I'm really glad you're here. Because this is awesome stuff to talk about, and it's, and it's worth talking about, and it can transform our relationships. And, and for some of you, you might, I mean, some of you, like, when that came up, you, you, like, you just kind of leaned back and were like, oh, man, this is why I'm not big on this Christianity stuff. Because all they want to do is put down women. And, but I just, I, I'm going to ask you to just kind of hang in there, right? I just want you to, to hold on, because this is such a, a rich and, and incredible teaching that has the power to transform our relationships. So let me, let me explain this a little bit, and, and we'll kind of uh, jump back in. Our English New Testaments come from Greek manuscripts. Most of you guys know that, right? So Jesus didn't speak King James English. Did anybody, did anybody know that? Okay, cool. Yeah, he didn't go with about speaking if as if he were from 1611. That's not, Jesus didn't speak English. Um, and so all of our transcripts that we have of the New Testament were written in Greek. And, and at the time uh, that they were translated from the Greek into the English, there were all kinds of Greek manuscripts floating around the Middle East and the Mediterranean Rim. There were Greek manuscripts all over the place of the New Testament, of Paul's writings. And so when they began to translate from the Greek into the English, here's what it literally said. Literally, the oldest manuscripts, this is what it read. If we were to translate it literally, it said this. It said, wives to your own husbands as to the Lord. So it's interesting. There's no verb in the original Greek translation. There's, there, there's no verb in that, in that verse at all. The word submit isn't in the literal, trans, the, the literal translation from the Greek. So before we explain that, I want, to, I want to explain something else, and it's really important. When, when the Apostle Paul's first century audience heard him teach about women submitting to their husbands, you know how our response, it's like, <gasps> you know what their response was in the first century when he taught that? Yeah, so tell us something we don't know. Like, we already knew that. That's what's expected. That's what we do. Like, hey, Paul, thanks for that enlightening teaching. But, like, we're well aware that we're supposed to submit. That's the culture we live in. We just live submitting because they told us to submit, and we do. That's kind of this, this whole idea. So, back to our verse, right? Why isn't the verb in this verse? And, and to answer this, it's because the verb comes from the verse before. And that was a common Greek grammatical practice. That was common for them in their day, in, in, in their grammar. They would borrow, they would basically make a statement with a verb, and then in the next statement, you don't include the verb, you just infer it from the previous statement. I know it's hard. I know it's, you didn't come for an English lesson, but I think it's kind of important, so we'll just kind of walk through it. Stick with me. Like, just, you know, kind of deal with it for a second. Um, so the verb submit is actually inferred from the verse that came before. So here's the question we have to ask, right? What was the verse that came before that held the verb? Like, if that didn't have the verb submit, and it came from a verse before, like, I think a really good question is, what's the verse before? And I'm going to tell you guys, this is a big deal. The verse before is huge. So let me just, let me just show you. Let me show you what Paul told us before he told wives that they should submit to their husbands because this sets the tone for everything that would follow. Here's what Paul said. Submit to one another. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. So once again, all of Paul's teaching points back to Jesus. It doesn't point back to the Old Testament. It doesn't point back to this is how we used to do it, and that's how society does it. Everything that Paul would say points back to Jesus. As, as Christ has loved you and done something extraordinary for you, so you must love 
one another. And Paul says this applies to all of our relationships, including marriage. That the way Jesus loved you is the way you're supposed to love everyone, including your spouse, including your boyfriend, your girlfriend, including your fiance, including whatever that is. We are to submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. So here's the idea, you guys. The submission is mutual. I know a lot of times we're like, well, wives are supposed to submit. Back it up one verse, right? We're supposed to submit to one another. The submission is mutual, even in marriage. Even in marriage, this all f- applies. This all flows through what Paul's teaching. And this is what makes relationships amazing. This is what makes marriage amazing. This is what happy couples know. They know that, hey, I'm here for you and you're here for me, but I'm not here for you because you're here for me. I'm here for you because Jesus was here for me and I'm gonna follow his lead and I wanna love you like he loved me. Like, that's what I want to try to do, and I don't get it right, but that's the heartbeat of what I want to do. And that's what happy couples know. That's what makes marriage worth it. That's what makes it amazing. The lesson here wasn't just wives submit. It was mutual submission. So here's the thing, though, you guys. In the first century audience, when that got taught, there was a whole lot of pushback. Like, we're all cool with wives submit, but whoa, 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 wait, What? We're supposed to submit to one another? Yeah. Yeah. And Paul tells us that Jesus is the model and he's the point of reference. Let me just share with you, if that wasn't enough to kind of shake up his first century audience, the next thing that Paul says in in line with this idea of marriage and relationships basically would garner from his first century audience the same response we gave to submit, to wives submit. The next thing he says, which is going to be kind of weird. Like, so here's what, here's what he says next in, in line with the idea and the topic of marriage. He says this, husbands, love your wives. And here, and we're sitting here going, yeah, that's like a no-brainer. Like, of course you're to love your wife. That wasn't the response the first century audience would have given it. The first century audience, the men would have said, whoa, hey, hang on. Like, we're all on board with wives submit but you mean we have an obligation to the women in our lives? Paul, you don't quite understand how this works. They're obligated to us. We're not obligated to them. And Paul's like, yeah, I'm not even done yet. Like, if you're wrestling with that, wait till I get to this next part. How are you supposed to love them? Just as. Back to that word that shows up again and again and again in Paul's writings, just as Christ, just as Christ did, just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. And they're like, wait a second, that didn't end up going really well for Christ. Like, anybody remember the story? Yeah, he got killed in all this. And they had to, they pressed pause in this whole idea But that's how God wants us to love our wives. Paul says, this is how you're supposed to love your wife with your whole life, unconditionally. Matter of fact, he says, if you're struggling with the theology of this command, let me make it a little more practical for you. I'm gonna give you some handles. Maybe maybe this whole love as Christ loved the church is just throwing you for a loop. Let me give you this one. Maybe we'll dumb it down for you guys because you need it dumbed down a little bit. Guys, here's maybe how you should love. Husbands, you ought to love your wife as your own body. He who loves his wife loves himself. The idea is whatever you believe your life is all about, Paul said, put your wife before that. Whatever you think your life is made up of and that's what like drives you and that's what motivates you and that's what makes you you, yeah, put your wife in front of that. Whatever that is. Paul's like, I know some of you were surprised when I said wives submit to your husbands. None of you were surprised. But in God's economy, men and women are equal. Do you know who the first person was with any authority to roll that idea out? Jesus. Jesus was the first person with any authority that rolled out the whole idea that men and women are equal. We're not the same, but we're equal. In God's eyes, we're equal. That's, and, and, and that was incredible. Think about who were the first people that took the gospel message to the rest of the crowd the day they found Jesus resurrected? Women. Jesus said, I need you to go and tell. But they're not gonna believe us. We're, we're women. Exactly, go and tell them anyway. They'll come around. 
oh, wait a second, 20 centuries later, and we're still trying to figure out how to come around. We can't love one another, you guys, the way Christ loved us and the way he wants us to love one another if we have a big box of expectations sitting between us. If our love becomes negotiated and conditional, and I will if you will, we are not loving the way Jesus loved us. We can't love the way Jesus loved us if there's these expectations that are constantly sitting between you and your significant other. And the problem is, as we get into these relationships and it becomes a tug of war, it becomes, you know, if I, I just got to get her to see it my way. She's got to understand this is better. This is better for all of us. This is the way I've always seen it. This is the way I've always done it. And maybe she's on the other side saying, I don't understand why he just won't let go of this thing. If he can see it the way I can see it, we'll see it better and we'll do it better. And the idea in this whole idea of relationship and, and submission to one another is that somebody in this relationship has to drop the rope. Somebody has to quit pulling and believing that your ways and your thoughts and your ideas are the ones that should, should trump everything else somebody else says. And the problem is, in order for this to work, it has to be mutual. In order for this to work, we both have to let go and say, you know what? What I want to do is I want to do whatever's best for you. I want to do what, what, what helps you, what encourages you, what supports you. In, in a tug of war between one another, you guys, even if someone wins... We, as a couple, don't win. And the problem is that some of you guys find yourselves in relationships where you find yourself winning a lot. And you know why you win a lot? You're the better negotiator in the relationship. It doesn't mean you're the better spouse in the relationship. You're just the stronger negotiator. The only way this is going to work, the only way we're going to love one another the way Jesus loved us, is we have to let go. We have, to, we have to quit believing that our ideas and our, our ways and our thoughts and our hopes, our dreams, our desires are so much better and, and bigger and, 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 and more important than the other. The law of Christ, the platinum rule applied in our marriage means we drop the rope and it has to be mutual. Why, right? Because God told us through the pen of Paul that we're to submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. That's what oneness in a relationship looks like. That's what it looks like. Oneness in a relationship doesn't look like, hey, that person's on board with me. Oneness in a relationship looks like, hey, I quit pulling and pushing and prodding and nagging and staying on and, and, and negotiating and bribing and shaming and guilting and all this. I quit doing that so I could be all that, I, that she needed so I could be a support and a help and an aid and love her the way Jesus loved me. And vice versa, that's what oneness in a relationship in a marriage looks like. So last week, I gave you a little bit of homework. You guys remember it? Did anybody do it? I won't ask that question. Never mind. Don't worry about it. I don't care if you did it. Um, I hope you did. But here's a, remember the question was, I, want you to, I wanted you to, to reflect and kind of get an idea of, of what's in your box, your own box, right? I said, hey, what's in your own box of hopes, dreams, and desires? So hopefully you took some time last week, thought about it like, hey, what do I hope this relationship becomes, or where do I see this relationship going, or, you know, five years from now, here's where I think we, I'd love for us to be as a, as a couple, or, or maybe you're not in a relationship, you're like, hey, this is what I hope that relationship would look like if I were to get into one, or, or to step into one, so hopefully you've done that, and then the other question, the follow-up question, if you remember, was, have you determined what your hopes, your dreams, and your desires are for your relationship, or your future relationship, and then the other question was, did you hand it to somebody else to fulfill, right? Because that's, that's what we want to try to get away from. That's not their job. Their job isn't to fulfill all of your hopes, dreams, and desires, right? But have you handed it off to someone else to fulfill? So today, I'm going to ask you to do something a little more challenging and a little more frightening, and that's okay, and you guys are good, and you're up for it. Um, but here's the thing. I want you to ask your girlfriend, your boyfriend, your fiance, your spouse this question. What's in your box? So now you're no longer asking, you're no longer reflecting on yourself, you're asking the person on the other side of you, what's in your box? And then I'm going to ask you to do something that for some of you is an incredible challenge, and it's going to be really difficult, but I want you to do this. After you ask the question, what's in your box, I want you to do this. I want you to stop talking, right? So you ask, and then you just listen. 
you stop talking. You don't continue to add on. And you start, start shaping their box. As they start telling you about their box, you don't start going, really? I don't know if that's really a good idea. Like, just don't say any of it. Don't just stop talking altogether. Just, just listen. So guys, one of the things, when you ask your girlfriend, fiance, your, your wife, this question, there, a couple things may happen. One, they may faint that you even cared enough to ask them. That, that may happen. They may like lose consciousness for a second. So just most of the time when you pass out, you breathe again on your own. They should be fine. But um, <laughs> so, so that, that's one response. The other response could be quite different than just fainting because you asked them. They could become incredibly angry. And it may sound something like, hey, we've been married for like 25 years and you don't have a clue as to what's in my box? Just take it. Just like, no, hon, I'm sorry, I, I don't. I, I've spent the last 25 years trying to figure out why you don't work out of my box. That's, so yeah, I'm sorry. What's, what, what's your hopes, dreams, desires? What are those again? Can you refresh my memory? So there's a couple of responses that could happen when, guys, when you, when you ask girls, that, the, the ladies that. Ladies, when you ask your boyfriend, your fiance, your husband, what's in his box, let me just warn you, there's probably gonna be one response. Nothing. Nothing. <laughs> Nothing. What are you talking about? What, what Are the Packers on? Like, what's going on? I, don't, I have no idea. What are you talking about? Nothing. Nothing. I, I have no idea. And, and, and we're not lying. I'll be honest with you. We're not lying. Most of us didn't even know we had a box, let alone know what was in it. So it, this may be a, an exercise in patience for you, just trying to figure out, you know, to get them to kind of talk about it a little bit. But here's the thing. Even though we didn't know we had a box, guys, somehow we're expecting her to do some stuff that we've never even defined or told her about, but we still have these expectations. So that's weird, right? So ladies, part of the problem is we don't know how to talk about this stuff, and we're a little bit frightened to talk about it because we don't know how to talk about it. But guys, again, it's really not fair to expect them to fulfill some things that you have never, ever defined or communicated, right? Are we okay with that? Right, I don't want like hate mail later this week from, from all the guys like, <laughs> she just wouldn't let it go. She just kept asking. It's all right. So that's your homework for this week. Ask your significant other what's in their box and then listen. And, and to be honest with you guys, this is, this is a big deal. I know it doesn't seem like a big deal, but it's kind of a big deal because this is the, I want to know you better so I know how to love you and support you better. This is, I'm all in. Like, I really honestly want to know what you're about and what your hopes are and what your dreams are, what your desires are, and how can I help that happen? How can I love you better and support you better in those? So this is, this is, the, this is the I'm all in question. This is the less self question. This is no longer about me. This is, babe, what does our life look like in your, your box of hopes and dreams and desires? What does your life look like in our box of hopes, dreams, and this is, this is the less self question. Here's the thing that we know about less self people. Less self people are happier people. You ever meet people that were very selfish? How happy are they? Not because it's all about getting whatever is next, whatever they want, whatever they desire, whatever they think they're owed. Or here's the other one that gets used in, in relationships a lot. Well, I deserve. We want to go there? So if you're a Christian, just newsflash, and you probably know this, but maybe it's a refresher course, you know what we deserve? Hell. We deserve hell. Because we have violated God's perfect standard, but because of his grace and his mercy and his selflessness, he came to us. For the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, bearing the shame to make us right with a holy God, like, so please, you guys, just don't do that, because a lot of times we're like, well, I deserve, and I, again, that's more self, not less self. Less self people are happier people, and less self relationships are richer relationships. When it becomes about the other person, that relationship has an opportunity to grow, and for love to grow and for gratitude to grow and for grace to flow in that relationship when it becomes about loving that other person the way that Jesus 
has loved us, right? That's the gospel, you guys. That's how the gospel gets carried into our marriages. That's how it gets reflected in our relationships, that whatever their need is, I want to do my best to meet that need because the gospel is in our deepest need. Jesus left heaven to meet it. He left the glory of heaven to come into our world to meet our need, and the least we can do is live out the gospel in our marriages, to live out what it looks like to put someone else first, to pour grace and to pour mercy instead of expectation and deservedness, right? Here's the last thought, you guys. Just as Jesus loved us, so we must love one another. Don't just think about that at three o'clock this afternoon when we have people coming around trunk or treat. Love them like Jesus loved us, but take that home. One of the best places to start practicing that is in your own home, in your own environments. And if you don't have a significant other, there's opportunities around you in your work environments and family environments and church environments and social environments to love others the way Jesus has loved you. Here's the thought. What if it's not about finding the right person, but it becomes about becoming the right person? wonder what our marriages would look like if we thought about it that way. Let me pray for you. Father God, we're just grateful that your son loved us selflessly, that he set all of the goodness and the glory of heaven aside to come into this earth to meet our needs, to know that we stood separated from a holy God and there was nothing we could do to have that need filled. And so he showed up and he filled it by giving his life away on our behalf. God, would you help us understand that that wasn't just a one-time occurrence, although it happened one time through Jesus, but that's something he wants to see replicated and, and repeated in our relationships, the willingness to give ourselves up in order to serve and to meet the needs of someone else. God, you said that the, the, the way that people will know that we're your, your son's followers is that we love the way you loved us. So God, help us start in our own home. And maybe it branches out from there into our extended families and social environments and work environments. God, would you just help us understand the one command we have to hold to is to love one another just as you loved us. Help us base everything off of that. Help us hinge everything off of that. And if we do, you'll get the glory. And your son will be seen and your spirit will have opportunity to move. And we pray that happens in Christ's name.